They called themselves Arab, or Amazai. Some swore their roots were Andalusian, others Saharan. But when the bones were unearthed in a forgotten cave in eastern Morocco, everything changed. Tafrilt, fifteen thousand years sealed in silence. And then a test, a strand of DNA that refused to play by the rules. It wasn't Arab. It wasn't fully African. It wasn't even Berber, at least. Not as we've come to define it. Instead, it whispered a buried truth. 63% Levantine, 37% Sub-Saharan. From a time before Arabic, before Islam, before the Sahara turned to sand, these weren't isolated tribes cut off by desert or sea. These were human beings moving across a continent that hadn't yet broken into borders. Trading stories, blood, ancestors. The Sahara? Back then, it wasn't a barrier. It was a savanna. Green. Alive. A highway of migration, not a wall of silence. And the Mediterranean? Just a narrow breath between Morocco and Iberia. A crossing, not a divide. So, what do you call a people whose bloodline flows through three worlds, but fits in none? You don't. You trace them. In bone. In genome. In secrets that refuse to stay buried. Imagine a map, not of countries, but of blood. Rivers of ancestry bleeding across what we thought were borders. Lines that pulse with forgotten migrations. With languages no one speaks anymore. With children born of windswept unions in places long erased by time. That is the map of Morocco. Not a melting pot. A memory vault. Ancient. Hybrid. Unlabeled. And yet, we keep asking the same question. Arab? African? European? Or something else entirely? Subscribe if you believe history doesn't end on the page. It lives in our bones. Because this, this was Morocco long before the Berbers, long before the Quran, before empire, before identity. But if these weren't Arabs, and they weren't yet Amazigh, then who were the first Moroccans? And why did their DNA look so familiar? They say the Sahara has always been a desert, a land of silence, of emptiness, of heat. But that's not true. Buried beneath the dunes is a forgotten memory, one that breathes through the bones of the dead and the genes of the living. Long before kingdoms, long before Arabic or Amazigh, there was something else. A lush world, green, endless, and alive. Ancient bones found at Tafrilt whispered a truth no history book dared print. Sub-Saharan ancestry, etched deep into their DNA, not from the slave trade. Not from the caravans, but from a time far older, when the Sahara was not a wall, but a window. They weren't lost souls in exile. They were pioneers, migrants walking across a land before it was named, before there was language, before anyone knew what culture even was. They came barefoot, carrying fire, stories, blood, the wind at their back. No flags, no religion, just movement, just survival. And they stayed. Inside their ancient genes, haplogroup L, a maternal signature still found today in southern Moroccans, echoes the sound of a world we've forgotten. A world where Africa and North Africa were not two stories, but one. It changes everything. Because if these people existed, if they moved across the Sahara when it was a savanna, not a graveyard, then the foundations of Moroccan identity stretch back farther than empire, farther than script. They weren't Arab. They weren't Berber. They were something else. Something older. And they didn't vanish. Their blood still runs through veins that don't know their names. But from this forgotten migration, from these barefoot mothers walking beneath the green sky, came a people who would not just survive history. They would resist it. For millennia. And they're not gone. Not yet. They don't stand on podiums. They don't write their names in marble. But in the blood of Moroccan mountains, they never left. In the atlas. In the riff. In the wind that cuts through stone villages and olive fields. There lives a lineage older than empire. Older than Arabic. Older than Rome itself. They are the children of E.M. 81. A single strand of Y-DNA. Quiet. Undefeated. Passed from father to son for nearly 14,000 years. Hidden in plain sight in the veins of men who speak Arabic today, but whose ancestors never bowed to any sultan's flag. They weren't erased. They were renamed. And in their silence, their blood kept talking. This isn't a tribal story. 
It's geological, etched into the rock of the rift, curled into the cliffs of the Middle Atlas. Mountain Berbers, Amazai, holding the genetic line while dynasties rose and collapsed in the plains below. Even their mothers carry a code. The mitochondrial U6 haplogroup, tracing back to the Near East, then looping, thousands of years later, into North Africa, like memories circling back home, long before the Quran, long before the word Moroccan even existed. And still these ancient lineages make up the majority, the invisible majority. Because despite the labels, despite the languages and the census forms, most Moroccans today carry this quiet ancestry, the kind you can't see but can feel, in the shape of a grandmother's cheekbone, in the rhythm of a drum played the same way for centuries. But if the bones whisper Berber, why do the names, the languages, the flags now say Arab? What happened? When did the story of the mountain get buried by the story of the plain? So many Moroccans walk with Amazai blood. So why do their genes say one thing, and their identity another? And more importantly, who rewrote the labels in the first place? They didn't come with flags. They came with flocks. From the dunes of Arabia, they moved westward, tribes of herders, warriors, poets, writing not just to conquer land, but to rewrite legacy. They weren't a single army. They were a migration, a movement one that would leave a permanent fingerprint on Morocco's bloodline. And it wasn't just language they carried. It was lineage. Inside the cells of millions of Moroccan men, today lives a silent witness to that journey. Haplogroup J1, also known as JM267, the chromosome of conquest, the DNA of the desert, found in as many as one in three Moroccan males. It didn't replace what came before. It layered over it. Arabization wasn't just a change in tongue, it was a demographic event, a genetic imprint that reshaped villages, cities, families. Land grants were given, new names were spoken, and slowly, what had been Amazai began to speak Arabic. But the mountain didn't forget. While Arab DNA spread across plains and lowlands, the high atlas kept its secrets. Up there, EM-81 still clings to the stone still echoes in the voice of an old shepherd calling in Tamazite, untouched by the tides below. This wasn't just history. It was identity, passed down in silence. A cultural fusion, a political realignment, a genetic reckoning. Because even those who call themselves Arab today carry stories in their blood older than the Quraysh. And still, Morocco was not finished absorbing. Because just as one migration shaped it from the east, another was about to arrive from the west. But this time, it wasn't warriors on horseback. It was refugees. Dispossessed. Broken. And they were bringing with them a different kind of memory. One forged in exile. They had Spanish names. European faces. Arabic prayers whispered in secret. In 1609, the ships came. But they weren't explorers or invaders. They were exiles. The Moriscos, Muslims forced to convert, then cast out from a land they once ruled. Generations born in Spain, now unwanted in it. They didn't return home. They were torn from it. Families who had lived in Andalusia longer than most Spaniards now crossed the sea as strangers, hoping Morocco might still remember their names, hoping it would offer more than land, hoping it would offer belonging. But exile leaves a mark deeper than displacement. They carried memories, music, recipes, dialects, and DNA. Today, you can still find them in the alleys of Rabat, the whitewashed homes of Tetuan, the old quarters of Fez. Mitochondrial haplogroups H and U, genetic echoes of Iberia, now whisper through the maternal lines of Moroccan families who no longer remember Spain, but still carry it in their blood. The Andalusian rhythm reshaped cities. It flavored the couscous, softened the oud, lingered in the architecture like perfume on old clothes. But it didn't erase what was already here. Beneath the coastal Andalusian skin, the bones remained Amazai. The base never broke. And yet, if you look close, Morocco today stands surprisingly near to southern Europe in genetic mirrors, as if exile and empire had sewn a thread so tight it never fully unraveled. But this closeness, this trace of Europe across Moroccan shores, it's only half the story. Because while Europe left fingerprints on the coastline, something much older was already rising from the desert, not from the north, 
from Africa's deep, forgotten south. And it wasn't coming with ships. It was coming with silence. They came in silence, no armies, no invasion. Just dust, trade, and time. Across the Sahara, the caravans moved. Camels groaning under salt, gold, ivory, and human lives. They crept northward, like veins pulsing through the desert, carrying more than goods. They carried memory. They carried blood. Not all of it was welcome. Today, deep inside the genomes of Moroccan Arabs, a quiet truth lingers. Mitochondrial haplogroups of sub-Saharan origin. L lineages. In some regions, they reached 30%, even 36%. But in the north, among Berbers high in the mountains, almost none. 1%, maybe 3. It isn't just a statistic. It's a silence. Because these maternal lineages tell a story rarely spoken aloud. Of women brought north. Of daughters born into unfamiliar soil. Their names forgotten. But not their blood. That blood speaks. And it says, we were here. Twice it came. In waves science can now trace. Once in the 12th century. Again in the 19th. Not myths. Not rumors. Genetic evidence. Etched in the cells of Amazigh women confirming what oral histories dared not carry. But here's what no one expected. Some of these African lineages predate slavery altogether. They arrived before the trade routes, before the merchants, before even the earliest kingdoms mapped the sand. How? Who were these first travelers, these sub-Saharan ancestors, who crossed a Sahara that wasn't yet a graveyard? And what were they seeking? Maybe they weren't victims of empire. Maybe they were the beginning of it a story lost beneath centuries of conquest, shame, and silence. But as DNA pulls the curtain back, we see something strange. Because just as Morocco's genetic mirror begins to reveal its southern soul, a reflection appears from the opposite direction. And it's not African. It's European. And it's 5,000 kilometers away. They should have had nothing in common. One people hunt reindeer beneath the northern lights, wrapped in silence, snow and shadow. The other herd goats beneath the Saharan sun, baked by heat, shaped by dunes, speaking in tones that echo across dry stone. The Sami of Scandinavia, the Berbers of North Africa, worlds apart, languages apart, landscapes apart, and yet, beneath all that difference, something ancient connects them. A strand of mitochondrial DNA, U5B1B, one of the oldest maternal lineages in Europe found in both the frozen north and the burning south. But how? To answer that, we have to go back, way back, before the ice retreated, before history had a name. Back then, during the last glacial maximum, life clung to the edges of survival, in a corner of what's now southern France and northern Spain. Small bands of humans waited out the cold. The Franco-Cantabrian refuge, a cradle of survival, a human bottleneck, and when the world thawed, they scattered. Some went north, chasing reindeer across melting tundra. Their descendants became the Sami. Others turned south, toward warmth, toward Africa. Their children became Amazigh. They would never meet again. But their DNA would remember. For 9,000 years, that maternal signature drifted. Through time, through bloodlines, through silence. Until modern science caught its breath in both Morocco and Scandinavia. Two peoples, one ancient mother, one story, split in two directions, the Sami and the Sarawi, distant cousins of the Ice Age. Not myth, not metaphor, molecular fact, because Morocco's diversity isn't a mystery to be solved. It's a code to be remembered, a fossil of migration so old, they predate language itself. So if Moroccan DNA echoes for continents, if it links snowfields to sand dunes, what, then, does that make its people? And who were they meant to become? You'd expect a nation to have a single story. One thread, one voice, one past. But Morocco's genome tells something else. It tells a mosaic, a contradiction, a kaleidoscope of ancestry. No single color, only layers. When scientists sequenced 109 Moroccan genomes, the result wasn't unity. It was complexity. Half of the DNA pointed inward, Maghribi, rooted, ancient. The rest was scattered like dust across history. Pieces from Europe, whispers from the Middle East, footprints from West Africa, and a fifth of it unclassified. 
a mystery without a name. This wasn't a melting pot. It was a palimpsest, a manuscript rewritten over and over, each chapter bleeding through the last. And yet, within this beautiful tangle, something stranger appeared. Even neighboring villages, just miles apart, held completely different genetic stories. The Berbers of Figig, for instance, carried traces from deep Africa. But in Ifni, just a few valleys over, the sub-Saharan signal was nearly gone. Same language, same flag, different histories beneath the skin. So what does it mean when two people shake hands and their ancestors never met? When one man's blood speaks of deserts and his neighbors of coasts? What do we call that? A nation? Or something older, something harder to define? Because if identity is built from stories, whose stories do we listen to? The ones we're told, or the ones our DNA refuses to forget? In Morocco, the answer may be both. Because here, your past isn't just behind you. It walks beside you. In your name. In your face. In the invisible, inescapable rhythm of your genes. But just when we thought the story ended at home, one strand, one ancient Moroccan gene, didn't stay in Morocco. It sailed north, far north, into lands of snow and saga.